I think we're ready. Okay, good morning. I apologize to everyone for being a little bit late. I was going to be on time and then I got caught in the paving project up by the key of the office. <laughs> so um, maybe we'll start by doing going around the room doing introductions. I'm Dave Snedeker, Chair of the Connectivity Advisory Board. And Ken Jones sitting in for Michael Sherling of the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Robert T. White, VTrans. Good morning, Ashlyn Doyon, Treasurer's Office. Uh, Michael DeHart, um, Department of Public Service Connectivity Coordinator. Uh, Corey Chase, Telecommunications Specialist, Department of Public Service. Evan Crossan, Two North co working your desk for this presentation. I'm Iris, I'm a reporter for VT Digger. Okay. And then Steve Whitaker. I got a point of order. I made specific requests to be notified and sent the agenda. That didn't happen and the agenda that did get posted didn't get posted 24 hours. So I believe your meeting is not in compliance with open meeting law. Okay, noted. noted. And, sir? Uh, I'm Steve Law from Orca Media. Okay. Steve Law, you said? Law, L-O-B-B. -B. Uh -huh. okay. And on the video we have Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Catherine Sims, Northeast Kingdom Collaborative. Okay, so that takes care of the uh, introductions. So the next item on the agenda uh, are the meeting minutes from April 18th, 2019. I can just note that um, Michael's not included as an attendee and yet he provided comments, so I probably signed in late. Do think that was the case? Yeah. Okay. Phone. So I have Michael Sherling to the, the yeah. list. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe go through do it once over and make sure I didn't misattribute anything to people because I was trying to learn all your names and take down everything you said at the same time. Um, I believe that all the comments from Michael Clausen in the treasurer's office are properly uh, attributed. Thanks. On page, what turned out to be page three of the minutes under this item 4.2, just a, a typo, I think, on my comment for uh, under D, it should be um, action plan versus action play. Uh, where was that? Uh, number D on uh, 4.2, under 4.2. It should be action plan as opposed to action play. Oh, yep, thank you. That's all I have. Are there any other corrections for the minutes? Okay, if not, I would uh, entertain a motion to approve the minutes of April 18th, 2019. Move to approve the minutes. Is there a second? Second. Okay, um, any, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Right I reiterate the objection that you're not in compliance with the law. You can't take formal action at this meeting because this isn't the meeting. No. Um, next item on the agenda uh, is new business. And the uh, first item under new business was suggested agenda changes. Michael, did you? Oh yeah, um, I didn't know if anybody had anything they wanted to address in this meeting. It's a little light. Um, connectivity initiatives kind of out the door at this point, and that's the major function of this board. So if anybody else has something they'd like to add, discuss, I'd be happy to tack it on. Okay. Are there any uh, suggested additions to the agenda? Can yeah, I, I'd like to know what the status of the microcell um, RFP in response. Okay. I can talk to that. Okay. Is that okay to talk now, or do you want to? Yeah. Okay. Right now, we're in. The, you're changing the agenda, so do you want to add that to the agenda? You want to continue adding things, agenda, or do you want to discuss let's do, that? Let's do it that way. So we'll add to, add to the agenda, then we'll discuss. So, any other additions to the agenda proposed? I'd uh, like an update on the public service department's new hire for a CUD specialist. And anything else? 
Yes. Suggested additions. All right. So um, if we can just jump to item B under new business, update on the connectivity initiative. Um, I'm not sure if Corey or Michael. Yeah, that'd be me. Um, We've got all of the agreements fully executed and out the door. One project is finished. Um, I should add a caveat. One project is not fully executed because of a misunderstanding. Um, one applicant didn't understand that it was a reimbursement grant, despite the RFP and the grant outline saying that it was. So we're renegotiating his agreement, trying to make it more workable for them. Um, other than that, um, MC Fiber is already finished working. That was fast. They're pushing to get their, their payment already, so <laughs> trying to keep up with them has been a task. I just have a question about that. Um, mm -hmm. Which project needs to be renegotiated, and also what happens to that money if it can't be renegotiated, mm -hmm. and does the board then need to approve it again? Or, so, or did we in the I don't know if I can sort of designate that authority to staff the public service department at the last meeting? So I don't know if I can discuss specifically which entity needs to be renegotiated with. I can say it's not MC Fiber. Okay. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that requires executive session or if that's okay. confidential for the company. Okay. Um, it's not. As for the issue um, and whether or not that responsibility has been given to us. I'm not entirely sure. I know the commissioner has final say on these things. Mm -hmm. um, it's unlikely that it doesn't go through. Um, but right now it's it's in discussion at the moment. So okay. it's not the best and, news for them. And it's happened before that the grants have been fully utilized, in which case the funds just go back to the next cycle of, of grants. Right. 2016, so. there were two rounds of connectivity initiative funding with the leftover funds. Yeah. Okay. So. The practice has been, this is Corey Chase, the practice has been to, put, um, if, if funds are not fully utilized, to put the funds back into the connectivity fund and um, use them in the next round of grants. Okay. Either, either in the case of um, the company not completing a negotiated uh, contract or um, it's the, the funds are reimbursement based, so if they don't use all the funds, if they come in under budget, the funds are used later. Yeah, and after this legislative session, we're hoping the connectivity initiative gets a little bit of extra funding. Can't say that it'll actually happen or how much it'll get, but hopefully more than 200000 because I think this year's money went or will go pretty far. Um, I think it's a pretty effective program at actually just finding areas where internet can go and building it out. Would that be as a result of the H513, which was the increasing monies to the universal service? Okay. But once it goes into the USF, I think some more allocation happens. So, the connectivity initiative is not necessarily first in line for that. Is that all for updates on the connectivity yep. issue? Yep. All right, so now we can jump to the additional agenda items. Uh, first, the microcell RFP. Record. So we, um, we conducted uh, an RFP uh, in, um, earlier this year, and uh, we had two bids, and we discussed the proposals with both, uh, both vendors, and um, both vendors, uh, we, we found the proposals to be problematic. And so um, in, in the, the case of one proposal, it was uh, to a, a, a novel new technology of um, using airships. The other um, proposal um, would have, have activated some, but not all of the locations. And um, we were concerned that it would use up too much of the capital funds, the remaining 900,000 capital funds, um, and not achieve a complete network. And so we, we paused our process negotiating with both vendors, and are in, um, currently we're um, talking to towns to consider the to ask towns to consider the idea of cost sharing. Um, so we prepared a survey and sent the survey to all 250 or 60 odd towns. It depends on whether you include villages or not. Um, but we sent the we, we talked to Vermont League of Cities and Towns and got the contact lists and sent the sent a query to all towns. 
um, and we asked towns if they would be interested in um, having microcells in their towns, and second, whether they'd be interested in helping to pay for those. Um, we're, um, we've had a, about 70 responses, um, and there are about 10 towns that we've not yet heard from where there are currently microcells installed. And so we're not, we don't have the results to discuss with you yet because um, we don't have a complete set of results. Um, I've been trying to get answers from towns, um, and it's not easy. <laughs> Everybody's busy, select boards or volunteers, um, and it's been frustrating. Um, but I imagine that we will have a report about that soon. From the responses you did receive, or can you say if they've agreed to provide some cost sharing funds or, or not? So there are some towns that are interested, there are many towns that are interested. Um, there are, as I recall, don't, I can't quote you exactly, but a, roughly um, two thirds of the towns we, that we heard from that participated in the, in the survey. Granted, it's not, we don't have answers from, I think, I think I said we had 70, 75 responses or something. Mm -hmm. So roughly two thirds of those towns that we heard from are interested in having microcells. Um, uh, less than that, than that um, are interested in paying. Um, okay. Not not all that responded are, are interested in paying. Um, and those that are interested in paying aren't interested in paying the full cost that um, it's that that the um, microcell uh, the full operating cost of, of each microcell. So in any event, if we are going to consider going down this road of using, uh, of participating with towns, it's going to require some amount of subsidy from somewhere to, to pay for it. So to be clear, what we, the, 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 the inquiry that we posed to towns was, uh, would you be willing to pay for um, the operating cost, the direct operating cost of microcells in your town? And, um, if you're interested, I can post the, I can share some information about that report. Yeah, that, that'd that'd be interesting to know what the kind of overall cost yeah, yeah, is. I was thinking that too. So um, what we heard from um, the previous vendor, uh, Vanu Coverage Code, was that the, uh, the direct operating cost for Microsoft sites is $1,800 per year for each site. And how many sites would happen or be put in place per town? at this stage? Right now there are 193 sites installed around the state and some towns have as much as, as many as 10, 12, some have this one. And these, these microcell sites are by and large installed on utility poles. And the operating, the direct operating costs include electricity, the DSL connectivity, and um, geolocation services. Any questions for Corey on the Microsoft project or RFP? Thank you, Corey. Uh, the next addition to the agenda was um, a request for the, an update on the new hire for the Public Service Department for the CUD specialist. Well, uh, Clay's not here, but he did let us know yesterday that he's put in the paperwork to create the position. So that about all we know. The timeline, I think what he should expect to be able to have the position out for hire by late August. Well, I think that's his hope. Yeah. Um, I, I think you recognize that state government doesn't move on a dime. Um, and so this is a, this is a new position. It's not, only new, it's not only a new position to, in addition to the staff of the department, it's a new position. And so, um, classified as a whole. Yeah, it's, it, the, the human, the, the state of Vermont Human Resources Department has to create a new job specification, mm -hmm. and that takes some amount of time for HR to do that. Once that job specification is created, then we can um, do a, a uh, then we can start to see candidates. Mm -hmm. But we can't do anything until Human Resources creates the this job specification. So I've started writing the RFP and getting help from uh, Corey and Clay on what rules there should be in place for this new grant program. So when this person starts the job, they should be already in the process of receiving applications, the Broadband Innovation Grant Program. Um, 
So they'll be more or less facilitating feasibility studies and business plans for towns and contractors they select to help them do the studies. Do you need a very brief update on this grant program from H513? Yeah. That would be great. Cool. Um, I forget what the budget is for this. Is it 700? Yeah, 700,000, so it's pretty significant. The maximum amount of one single grant is $60,000. There are two deliverables for each grant. They come in phases, the first of which is a feasibility study. So we're asking these applicants, tentatively right now, we're still writing the rules, but we plan to ask applicants to identify a service area and preliminarily a type of technology and they can sort, their, they can sort out the details after they've made their proposal and we've accepted it. Um, but they'll start working and determine, based on infrastructure costs, uh, estimated take rates, uh, what, whether or not it'll be feasible and whether or not they could be cash flow positive at any point in time with the, with the plan they have. Um, we expect to hear a lot of different types of solutions, be it CUDs or even all the way from CUDs to just paying the existing ISP to build out at the cost. You know, anything's on the table. Um, so yeah, the first $30,000 of, well, the maximum is 60. They can come in under 60. The first half of the grant money will be paid after they turn in their feasibility study and we determine that it's credible. Um, we're determining what the classifications of credible are in this case and what classifications for feasible are in this case. Um, as H513 was written, there's a bit of wiggle room involved, so we want to make sure it's pretty tight. It's being a big grant program, we don't want to have it be ineffective. Um, so after a feasibility study is determined to be credible and feasible, we would suggest they move on to the business planning study, which is the second half of the requirement. Um, and their business plan you know, will take the form of infrastructure planning, uh, the whole nine yards. Uh, something Corey suggested and I'm contemplating putting into the application is that the business plan has to be something that a lending institution would feel comfortable uh, lending to. So we don't want just you know, Joe Schmo down the street trying to say, I give me forty thousand bucks, I'll put some poles in the ground, yeah. So, you know, we don't run businesses, but we want some third party to be able to verify this is a credible business plan and this feasibility that they've accredited themselves with is feasible. Um, so yeah, I don't know how long this grant program will run, but seven hundred thousand dollars can probably last it a while, depending on how many responses we get. Uh, the first round precludes electric utilities. Um, I think after February, we're allowed to open it up to studies that study or that include or suggest that electric utility be the provider or the partner in the program. Um, and there's a few legislative reporting requirements associated both with this and with the idea of electric utilities being broadband providers. Mm -hmm. Because regarding electric utilities, they have their separate track. The two of them can apply before. Only two, yeah. Right, but that, that can take place early, earlier than February. No. So the electric utilities can't apply until February. So are they waiting for then the results of the work that you're sponsoring on general electric utility participation and broadband? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so they we do have that, then the results of that allow the electric utilities to potentially. pursue. Oh. So H513 set out like a, a laser minefield of deadlines for our department to hit, some of which conflict directly with each other. Uh, for example, we're required to report on this grant program, I think, in January. and we weren't allowed to start working on it until late June. And it's a seven month grant term. So we don't expect to have a full report by January. And I think estimated February will open it up to electric utilities. Um, well, or potentially. So yeah. to, I'll, just, I'll just add to that. We, um, another update, so this wasn't on your agenda, but I think it's pertinent. Mm -hmm. um, 
we the, the H five thirteen directed our, our department to write a report about the feasibility of electric utilities getting involved in broadband service. And so we um, we have conducted an RFP, and right now we're negotiating with vendors. Um, uh, we've received many bids, um, and we're selecting a, a, a vendor to assist us in writing this report about the feasibility of electric utilities being involved in broadband. And the result, based on the results of that report, um, we'll then determine whether or not to um, whether or not electric utilities are eligible for these. Um, feasibility studies. Because mm -hmm. if the so report I, says, I thought, that, I thought the stat, I thought the statute said, "Thou shalt provide grants to two electric utilities to have them pursue feasibility studies." If the if the re results oh, of this really report, that? Is that what, okay. I if the results that. of this report are con, are um, okay. support the idea that because if, if the, the reason they put this report in is that um, there was concern that maybe electric utilities shouldn't be involved in the process, mm -hmm. in which case it would be um, you can't give them grants to do something that they shouldn't be doing. So we're we're doing this report. This report, if the report is conclusive, um, then up to two electric utilities. Um, are eligible to receive these feasibility grants for feasibility for their individual electric utility. What's the scope of this report? Is it statewide or is it? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. so it's what, it's what general about mentioned? whether or not um, electric utilities ought to be involved in the broadband um, arena. And the fact that some electric utilities outside of Vermont are doesn't. So I found that in the statute again, uh, not more than two electric utilities uh, shall be awarded a grant under the program. Awards to distribution utilities shall be made pursuant to a competitive bidding process initiated not sooner than January 1, 2020. So it's not February, it's uh, January 1. But, but these, because the intent was by then you'd have a better sense from the, right. from the general study. Yeah. yeah. Who, who are other eligible applicants for these grants? So the brand that, that we're getting ready to do now, the RFP that mm -hmm. we're hoping to release very soon, um, is pretty wide open. Um, it has to be an entity, uh, some mm -hmm. kind of a legal entity, but it could be a town, it could be a private business. It could be a, a formation of or a partnership with a cooperative, a CUD, a rural economic development infrastructure district, a municipal communication plant, or a utility. Um, but that's not an exhaustive list. Could it be a regional planning commission or a regional development corporation? I don't see why not. Okay. Yeah. Could it be a Muni Electric? At that point, it's, it's, a, it's a distribution it's, utility. Yeah. Um, so that's included in the intent. Yeah. Uh, that's included in it, but. But then there's the other. And that brings in the the timeline for yeah. it. Yeah. Did you say what the timeline for this first RFP distribution and then award is? Um. I'm not sure when the deadline actually is. We've just been working as fast as possible <laughs> on getting that done. So you're hope, hoping to have it out ASAP with applications due at some point and then awards for a year? Yeah, we've been mostly um, using a microscope on the RFP right now. I don't know when we plan on getting it out, but as soon as we're finished, we're going to advertise it. And we want to give town, we want to give at least at least a month, perhaps longer, for respondents to prepare a proposal because mm -hmm. um, especially towns need to wait for a select board meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we, we've heard um, many inquiries about this grant program. There are probably going to be a significant number of people, of, of entities interested in it. Because it's, it's the state offering up to $60,000 for an entity to evaluate whether it's um, feasible for, for them to get involved. So pick a small town in Vermont. It, it, they don't know if it's feasible for them to be involved in doing broadband. So this, the idea here is to provide them the funds to hire an expert to look at it and say it makes sense or, or it doesn't make sense. Yeah, I look forward to all the responses. And in some ways, especially the ones that don't return a feasible outcome. Because then we can kind of find out what the line is, what the mark they need to hit will be, and sort of get out of the gray area for what's possible and what's not. You know. We want. Can you are going to allow for-profit businesses to apply as well? Yes. Um, so like a Kingdom Fiber, but even a consolidated could apply for a feasibility grant. 
I don't think we've discussed that possibility, but um, the statute's pretty broad. Yeah, I mean, the statute open. wants to give uh, give uh, entities an opportunity to apply for it. But we, I think, will use some judgment in determining which to vendors to which recipients to award grants to. So we'll be lending preference to area to feasibility studies that plan to study areas with locations that are on the connectivity initiative eligible locations list. So there's preference for unserved and underserved locations, uh, both from a department level, but also in the language of the statute, um, or of the bill, I should say. Um, yeah. I, I, I think it. we should say that, um, it, it, I, I'll just echo what Michael said, that this that the money is given for um, feasibility studies. and. It's entirely possible that, um, or expect, perhaps even to be expected, that many of these will come back with a finding that it's not feasible. Mm -hmm. And that's good and fine. The, 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 it doesn't necessarily mean that you, um, just because you've sought the grant, that you're going to go out and do the project. A town might learn through this process that, wow, this is really complicated, and this, is, this doesn't make sense. But we want to allow for that. That's the whole purpose. Mm -hmm. And those studies. We hope that many will, will find it and go out and build broadband projects and prosper. But we, we're open to the idea that you look and determine that it won't, that it's not a good idea. And those studies will become the property of the state of Vermont and the Department of Public Service. So that can inform future telecom planning efforts and granting guidelines and things of that nature. Um, this should be pretty informative. I do think it's prudent to go backwards on the agenda to uh, update on the connectivity initiative, if that's okay. Yep. Um, H513 does include a couple of changes to the connectivity initiative that I didn't mention. Um, easy to gloss over because we've been sort of just pushing forward so much on this new grant. Um, the speed thresholds in the connectivity initiative have been changed to 25.3, which is not insignificant. It sort of rules out uh, the far reaches of DSL. Um, and there's also a new requirement that any services funded in whole or in part by monies from the initiative shall be capable of being continuously upgraded to reflect the best available, most economically feasible service capabilities. So DSL has less elbow room, more or less. It's sort of the, the rub here. Thanks. Any questions for uh, Michael or Corey on the H513 or the connectivity initiative? Catherine, any questions? Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, for is schedule regular meetings and schedule a summer public meeting. And I think the, the last meeting we talked about a requirement is to have meetings on at least a quarterly basis, but we talked about maybe doing a little bit more than that, maybe at least. Not more than six, six. Is, in the, is in the statute. Six, okay. Six is the most. Um, so this next meeting, we've been suggesting be the open house style public meeting, all of them are public, um, depending on whether or not you believe what Mr. Whitaker says. Um, yeah, so this next one will include our commissioner and should be a discussion of the telecom plan. Um, that's been the plan, at least. Is there a date for that? We've not picked a date yet. Um, we figured an afternoon in late summer before it starts getting cold. But <coughs> don't really want to push too far out, but it'll avoid being quarterly if we go too close or, yeah. A tentatively September. Okay. Um, if you want, we could pick a date right now, or we can do it via via email. Would this meeting take place here, or would you be thinking in a different location that's, so to be a more like public forum? I'm not. Yeah, that's worth discussing. It, that just impacts. The pavilion the is pretty convenient. Yeah. Pavilion. I'm not sure. I've never been there. Oh, it's across the street. Okay. The the auditorium. Yeah. Yeah. Um, probably not do a morning meeting so we can actually have people come. Um, afternoon. Sure. 
probably best to check the commissioner's calendar, I would think. Yeah. And then put some dates out there. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll send out a doodle poll and uh, CC June. See what her availability is like. Tentatively, middle of September sometime. Yeah. I think it misses everybody's vacation schedules. Okay. And so you mentioned to discuss the telecom plan. What What is the status? Uh, I saw drafts. I don't know if I've seen you know, at the end of 2018. Mm -hmm. And is there is there a new... Or do you intend there to be a new draft that will be the subject of discussion? Or We've been making changes, but Corey, I don't know if you can speak to that. So uh, it's, it's a frustrating situation right now. The, um, the draft um, that's out there, the only thing that re remains for it to become uh, adopted is a meeting with the joint, um, the joint houses yeah. of the legislature. And they didn't do that. So it can't be adopted. Well, um, but this meeting is to discuss it. So did you in, in light of that, that situation, we're continuing on to re revise the plan again um, to add new content um, based on the feedback that we've been receiving. Um, so I don't think that we have an answer for to, to a direct answer to your question yet. Um, we're hoping to have a new, um, re a new revision out, um, but it's hard to do that and do all of these other things we're trying to do too. And I know that the commissioner wanted to, to have to participate in the meeting um, and talk so more about it. We've written what two new sections that were in five thirteen. I don't recall right now. Okay, there were several that we were right we're working on revisions for. Yeah. Prior to the meeting, and I know that it's a, a pretty long plan, so maybe um, if you're planning on if we're going to be meeting in September, could you send at some point in August the most current draft? That you have with the new sections yeah. around? Yes, certainly. Thank you. And representing the agency of commerce, we're supposed to participate in that development of that plan. So if you could share the updates with us, that would be useful. Certainly. So it seems like you're recommending that it would be helpful for us to circulate a draft to your agencies before we um, make a public. As they say, statute requires the agency of commerce to community development to be part of the development. So, and I and I know that if the treasurer's office is going to be participating in you know a, a, a meeting where the purpose is for members of the public to comment on the mm -hmm. plan, we would like to be able to read all the sections that you've added since the passage sure. of 515. That makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, off the top of my head, I know we've got the battery backup section stipulated from 513. Um, okay. That's been added, but I don't know if that's been published because we're sort of thinking of it as a new plan already at this point. Living document, as they say. But yes, to your point, we'll send it around. Thank you. On the scheduling of regular meetings, can we just set a, a year's worth of meetings of the calendar and get them all down at once? That way we're. Sure. It's your meetings. Okay. <laughs> okay. So quarterly would be every three months. Um, if we just don't treat the September meeting as one of the quarterly meetings, or should or should we treat that as a quarterly meeting? Doesn't the statute say something about that that the uh, that the board needs to have a public meeting? Yes, not more than six, and we've been shooting for quarterly. Um, but does, and then it also has to have one public meeting. Well, they're all supposed to be, yeah, but I know what you're saying. One, one, is, one is supposed to be a, one is like a different. A it's a joint meeting. Yeah, um, to to truly invite to the public to participate. All all these meetings are public. So. Uh, that's what I meant. But, I yeah, but mean, the, that one that's focused on really getting the the input from the public about the direction of right. Yeah. So we can choose to make that one of the quarterly meetings, or just create a quarterly schedule and also include September's meeting. Whichever we prefer. So if we include September's meeting, then the next we can have a meeting in December and then March and then I guess July, something like that? Yeah. Um, so December we should probably shoot for the early half of the month. Mm -hmm. yeah. before, before we all turn into pumpkins. Mm -hmm.
that's today's Thursday, right? Friday. Today's Friday. Today's Friday. How about December? Do you want to just 30th? send a doodle poll out for all of us because we're looking so far out? Sure. Um, I know my calendar is empty in December, but <laughs> <laughs> others might not be so fortunate. Okay, I'll make that a action item then. As you're making the doodle poll, I would put in a plug um, in in March. The week of town meeting is always a good week to have longer meetings um, because folks don't need to be over at the legislature. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, that's helpful. Did you say a specific time in March or just March? The, the week of town oh, meeting in okay. March is um, the legislature's not in session. Okay. So. Whichever weekend that is. Yeah. I have one um, other little thing to add in updates about what we've been doing. Just because you mentioned regional planning commissions, I'd forgotten to mention it previously. Mm -hmm. um, an update on our mobile wireless drive testing. So we, we did the mobile wireless drive test for the particular reason um, to participate in the FCC challenge in December. Um, since then, we've had inquiries from regional planning commissions and towns to borrow the phones to do more testing. So the test that I, I drove just the main roads, just the federal aid highways. But um, many towns, we've had inquiries from six or seven towns, but also several regional planning commissions, um, including yours. Yeah. Um, we've let them borrow the phones, and they've got uh, interns and volunteers that have driven the back roads. Um, and the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission has a VISTA volunteer, and they plan to do all of the roads of all of the Central Vermont plant towns um, this summer. Once all of the driving is done, we're, we will update the interactive map. So you get all the, you get all the data. Once the, once yeah. the data is collected, we'll um, update the map. So the map has not been updated with the new data, but when it's collected, we will update the map. Yeah, I talked to, um, I know we did it, and then I think Addison County's already completed the work, or, or at least they're thinking about they're it. They're thinking about it. Addison and Lamoille County. Yeah. Yeah. Lamoille and, and Central Vermont are the ones that are. Has any other state done this? I haven't been talking to other states, I don't know. <laughs> I know that New Hampshire, when they were doing their um, drive tests last fall, worked with planning commissions. Um, okay. But they didn't have as much time because it was also crunched. We had uh, a tech savvy transportation intern who was more than happy to help us out with that. It was a good, good project. Anything else, Corey? No. Anything else on the, the meeting schedules? Can I just ask a quick? Is that broken down by carrier? Uh, yes. Great. I'll send you a link. Please, Robert, yeah, it's um, cool. Please. Each cell phone in the little bank represented a different carrier, for instance, I understand you. Nice. I mean, six, I think. Yeah, so there are six facilities-based cell phone carriers in the state. Um, there are many other that resell each of those six, but there are six separate networks of towers. No, specifically interested in at and Yeah. Is that who you guys primarily use, or? No, FirstNet. Okay. So Terry LaValle has the um, the the bra data. Yeah, um, I know, but we're about we when I say we be trained, we're battling with them just on our own our own infrastructure that we're putting out. Yeah, I know it's frustrating. I'll make sure to get you offline the, the data. Thank you. Yeah, you didn't have what's that? What's the band fourteen? You didn't, did you have a band fourteen phone? No. Oh, cool. Can, can you add one? Yeah, because I can get you. Yeah, if you want to, if you want a person that band 14 sim, I can get you one. That's a yeah. good idea. Yeah, we should yeah, add that's that. That's what I've got now. And trust me, I'm battling with them. See, <coughs> the, the difficulty would be, um, we could talk more about that later. But yeah. it, it, to to exclude it so that it only operates in that band, because uh, we have an AT and T phone. That's just a, yeah, yeah. But do you have? Does that have news? No, no. It's just t right. checking that. So yeah. No, 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 we're just saying we'll, we'll, we'll get you the, uh, the SIM, the new AT&T SIM that they claim covers all that. It should cover both band 14 as well as, well as regular. Yeah. And I would remember both. Right. Because it's for regular consumers and then for the public safety community. Right. Yeah, that's a good idea. 
Or you have it. You can have my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, the, 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 the app that we use for testing is an Android app. Yep, I figured that. Okay. Um, anything, else? anything else, Robert? No, 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 just saying thank you for allowing me to interrupt. Sure. Um, number five on the agenda is uh, for public comments. So, uh, um, Iris, Stephen, or Steve, any comments? Yeah, I have some. <clears throat> uh, I want to caution that the drive test methodology is not anywhere close to the drive test methodology that was done statewide in 2010 and 2013. Um, the sampling frequency, the signal measuring the signal strength and logging the signal strength. The signal strength is relevant. You may not be able to, you may have signal but not be able to complete a voice call. That has direct bearing on whether 911 connectivity is effective. Uh, if we are gonna do statewide, and it seems like we're promoting everybody use this set of cell phones and drive your county or your regional planning district, uh, we should really pause and take a look at whether we should be doing it to a certain standard. Um, there are vendors, Paracol is the vendor that we used, the state paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to in 2010 and 2013. Um, but I've researched it, and currently the data we're collecting with the purpose-specific project that Corey described is not adequate to do the kind of planning we need to be doing. Both the frequency of sampling, GPS location, and signal strength, uh, we should really be doing uh, once so we don't have to go back and do it again. The Microcell, on the microcells, I understand there was 55 new microcells, carrier-specific microcells deployed by AT&T, uh, kind of end arounding and subverting the neutral host microcell model that coverage code was. Uh, these are AT&T only band 14 microcells for FirstNet, whereas we're kind of missing the opportunity to leverage those microcells into all carriers neutral host model. So are they band 14 only? I am not privy to that information. Do you know, do you know Robert, whether the, the new microcells at and are they band 14 only or are they there's band 14 capable, okay. but at and only, Verizon folks can. I mean, uh, part of the problem is that this is shrouded in secrecy. And for that for clarity, is this, is this about FirstNet or at and private deployment or a state deployment? I want to take it down correctly. It's about all that. three, but it's FirstNet. Is the it's it's FirstNet, I believe, that's driving this small cell deployment. The department's small cell deployment? No. Okay. The AT&T, these are new microcells. I also make call the advisory board's attention to the fact that two years ago, the legislature required, at the, upon the failure of coverage go, the legislature required the department to do a study uh, of microcell technology, costs, alternatives, need for subsidies, et cetera. That report was grossly inadequate. It really is a shell of a report, and therefore we're lacking the information now, and the department's admitting that it's lacking the information in order to adequately advise these towns on whether uh, they should deploy the 2G microcells that the state already owns. Um, I would encourage this board to advise the commissioner to get that report done professionally by an independent uh, engineer, whomever. Uh, that microcell report, all the department did was to crib the numbers out of the coverage code report and did not look at the opportunities for reduced uh, backhaul costs, reduced electric costs, meterless installs, many things that could actually reduce the cost, the operating cost of the microcells and make it feasible for these towns. Similarly, there's no way that the towns will be interested in putting the bill an unknown amount for the back-end routing uh, geolocation. The geolocation charges should come out of the 911 fund because the 911 service is the only thing that requires those. But the 911 fund is 
one of the first things out of the Universal Service Fund. And again, if it's only 911 that requires that geolocation, that cost, which is a substantial cost of deploying each microcell, should not be burdened on the town. It should be burdened on the state 911 fund. Um, we've got a multi-million dollar investment in these microcells, and it's going to waste while these things sit idle on the poles or in boxes in a warehouse. And this board was created five years ago, four years ago, uh, to advise on these issues. And FirstNet was a major one, and this board didn't do it. This board has, in effect, been rubber stamping connectivity grants and not advising on the plan. And I understand that the new planning requirements of 513 require, if I recall, specific strategies to address each, every goal and objective of 202C. And that is a major shift in the role of the telecom plan. And I would encourage you to read the goals of 202C. That's the state policy of telecom. And imagine what a telecom plan is going to need to look like if it's going to have a specific strategy to address every one of those goals. Um, the, there's a new set of uh, antenna regulations that were just adopted in, on the West Coast that are worth looking at. The, the antenna, the expedited 248A, expedited tower siding and antenna siding, does come up for a sunset again. And there's going to be a huge rush to get everything permitted uh, ahead of that sunset. Um, but there are goals that are not uh, preempted by the FCC. There are design parameters and um, restrictions that can and should be considered by this board to advise the commissioner on what should be in the telecom plan related to small cell siting. The towns and the league are uh, actively engaged in not being preempted and not having these major carriers come in and throw small cell antennas wherever they feel like it. Um, so that that's again one that should be um, high on your list. This idea of meeting quarterly to, you know, rubber stamp grants is, is absurd when you've got a statutory body that has the ability even to diverge from what the department wants to do. It's okay if the, this advisory board wants to say something different than what is the company line. Uh, it would be a healthy debate to have. Um, so I would encourage you to uh, review the history of the FirstNet decision review the microcell report or lack thereof, uh, weigh in on the who pays for the geolocation of the microcells, and uh, whether there's an incremental strategy where the towns can be invited to host the 2G microcells and build out fiber anticipating an upgrade to a 4G cell and use some of those extra strands to uh, instigate community fiber initiatives like these communications union districts. The isolation docket where telephone exchanges and entire switches like Comcast and Charter are isolated and those people cannot call 911. That docket is open at the PUC and had a workshop last week. The transcript's not yet available. I would encourage you to read that and realize that it's not cost effective for Consolidated to build a special multi-mile fiber link to remedy that isolation. Isolation is when there's not a diverse route via a different geographic path. And so that one cable, be it a T1 or a fiber, gets broken. Those people in those exchanges cannot reach the outside world or 911. And it's not cost effective for Consolidated to take on that entire cost and bill it to the ratepayers, whereas it is cost effective it may well be cost effective to align the priorities of microcell placement, community fiber, and isolation remedy in the same fiber sheath. So it's going to push back on the BTA model of state owned middle mile fiber, which I know the commissioner, current commissioner, is adamantly 
uh, opposed to. But this commission, this advisory board could come out and say we should revive BTA or some function of, of BTA for state-owned middle mile fiber to accomplish these things. Currently, there's no state agency, talk to John Quinn, the ADS secretary, no state agency is responsible for thinking across the silos like that. You've got a public safety imperative, you've got microcells, you've got FirstNet, you've got this telephone isolation issue and community broadband, all of which could be consolidated or uh, could make cost effective a fiber bill. The state also has the authority under conditions on every VTRANS permit to overlash its own fiber to facilities that others have permitted at no cost. That would mean no delays for make ready, no poll. Not true. What's not true? That violates federal law. State law cannot over state law cannot overrule federal law. Well, the permit condition continue reads, on, continue on. The, the permit condition reads that continue on. I am. The permit condition reads that the state may for its own use That's overlash right. that violates the federal law. Your permit condition doesn't read that. It violates federal law. So you're going to take it out of all the permits conditions? Nope. nope. So I'd appreciate not being interrupted while I finish. I would appreciate it too. So the permit condition that's been attached to every fiber bill permit is that the state is allowed for its own purpose to build fiber overlashing to the existing facilities built by the other carriers. That would potentially reduce the cost of fiber builds by half or more uh, in this in this network spans where there is no fiber so it remains to be argued whether the state's economic development and public safety qualify under that uh, for its own purpose um, I'm I know that Bob's not a lawyer so he's you know he can have his opinion but uh, I have been tracking that issue and this board, this advisory board should clearly do so. Uh, that opportunity would open up and revive the uh, the idea that we're going to, it's 500 million or a billion to build fiber to every address is totally unfounded. The information we have on where the fiber is is so incomplete and there's no effort. The department opposed the language in H513 amendments that would have built a GIS of where the fiber is and where it is not. The department is enjoying being the only one with that information under non-disclosure agreements, and yet this advisory board should direct the department to require the production of that information under the 202D authority. The 202E authority is where the non-disclosure agreements are, and that's what's muddied the water and pushed all this information underground. <coughs> Whereas the 202D authority does not include that. And it can, can be argued that if it's clearly in the public right of way and it's clearly visible, that fiber is not a secret. Who owns it and where it is should be public information to help facilitate all these planning and feasibility studies that are underway. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, do you have those comments in writing? Because the minutes will struggle to reflect. That's why you record, right? The number of topics you just covered. We have, we you may have, want to just check in. But do we have a transcript? Do we have a recording of this? No, not recording this one. I would Parker. also encourage you to Parker record does. all your meetings because uh, I shouldn't be the only one with a copy or orca. Are there other public comments? Uh, quick question. Sorry, I found out I was covering this meeting five minutes before it started in the 210 of Thunder Church. Microcells are different than H513. Are they related? So the state, um, a, a former um, part of state government, the Vermont Telecommunications Authority, uh, acquired 400 microcell devices. These are small devices that provide coverage of approximately a quarter to a half a mile radius, and so there's cell phone coverage. Yeah. And they provide cell phone coverage. Um, they're capable of providing cell phone coverage in areas that have no coverage from other providers. And the former um, vendor that worked for the VTA, Banu Coverage Co., had agreements with um, major carriers so that the customers of those major carriers could roam onto the service of these microcells when they were outside their own coverage area. 
Unfortunately, that company um, ran into financial problems, and this, the network, the, the, the 193 microcells that they installed were shut off. So there's 193 installed now. The remaining 207 are in our warehouse. Any other public comments? Okay. Uh, hearing none, the next item on the agenda is a uh, motion for adjournment. Do I have a motion? Make the motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Thank you, everybody. Well, thanks for making it. Um, thanks, everyone. Thanks to Orca for being here.